On this episode of China Unscripted, we talk with Chinese dissident artist Ba Diu Cao about why the Chinese Communist Party fears his work and his art in the era of the coronavirus. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesda. Tonight, we have a very exciting guest joining us, but uh, to get us in the mood, we're drinking some tea from our sponsors, Path of Cha. We are drinking Honey Orchid Milan Xiang Danzong Oolong Tea. Gan Bei. Gan Bei. This is good tea. Mm, it tastes like a honey orchid. Do you Gan Bei tea? Um, technically, no, but I do. Okay. I'm a teetotaler. What can I say? Mm. Oh. I know. I know. What, wait, what's that horrible alcohol that that people drink right. in China? By, not just Baijiu, but like, what's that one brand? Ma- Mao Tai. Uh, Mao Tai, like the really yeah. expensive. The really you? expensive. I have a bottle that I've inherited from my parents. It's probably vinegar by now, <laughs> but I've never. So slightly more drinkable. <laughs> I don't know. I've never thrown it away because it's like three hundred dollars. Oh gosh. Well, so if you'd like to enjoy some great tea while listening to the China Scripted podcast, you can support the show if you order some tea from Path of Cha. Use this web link: go dot path of cha dot com slash unscripted support the show have some great tea also they are currently not sourcing from china as concerns about the coronavirus are happening so rest assured joining us tonight is badio Cao, a chinese political cartoonist artist and rights activist based in australia and if you're watching on youtube we'll be putting up a slideshow of some of the art from his instagram page thanks for joining us today uh, it's my pleasure so I think to give listeners kind of an idea about uh, the kind of guy you are, uh, how about you tell us what you have on your right arm? Um, I have a tattoo that's been put on on the 25th anniversary of Tim and Massacre. It was the Tank Man. Um, well, I really like this image. I think it's very inspiring for many people around the world. I want to put it on the arm, uh, which I use to draw as a reminder that I think art should always be used for a purpose. And for me, the purpose is about advocating for human rights. That's really cool. I, I can't say I have any equivalent. No Tank Man tattoo on your arm, Chris? No, no, no. You're definitely making me look bad. Uh, all right, so you were you were born in China, and you were studying to become a lawyer, but you gave that up to become a political cartoonist and artist. So your mother must have been so disappointed. <laughs> yeah, like any uh, Asian mom, well, <laughs> no offense, but uh, yeah, I was set as a route to be, a, you know, this kind of A student and uh, get a good job, get a good life. But I guess this is just not enough for me. Uh, partially because I, my family, like my great parents, they were artists as well. Uh, they were the first group of uh, filmmakers in China, uh, very active during the uh, 1920s until uh, the so-called anti-right wing um, campaign started, the Hundred Blossom campaign, uh, which kills. Um, my grandpa uh, because of his film so for my family to be an artist uh, is not an option because uh, well they would never want me to repeat the tragedy of my great parents but you know the more sometimes your parents don't want you to be the more you actually want to give it a try um, <laughs> also I, I mean I have the confidence that uh, with the talents uh, running my family like my grandparents, uh, I do believe that I have the potential to be an artist. So I guess it's also kind of inevitably I ended up giving up what I learned in the law school but pursuing something very different. It was in your blood. I think so. Yeah. And just to give a quick uh, historical context for people listening, the 1920s, that was the Republic of China period. And then by the anti rightist campaign, that was after Mao's communist forces had taken over China. Yeah, that's right. Did you decide to be an artist while you were in China? Uh, well, yes or no. Uh, 
I guess what I decided is um, when I started in China in the university, I realized that my life will be very, um, how can I say it, the trajectory of my life will be very set, that I know what kind of life I will have to live with, uh, which is very hard to make a life if you don't have those guanxi or relationship within the government, which is definitely something that I don't have in my family. Um, and this type of, you know, fixed possibility makes me feel suffocated. Um, but also, I mean, according to my family history, the, the country is definitely problematic uh, in the history. And the more that I learn, the more that I experience within the society, the more that I believe that it is still the same country that persecuted my great parents decades ago. So that makes me want to leave and seeking different life. Um, but to be an artist, I guess eventually it is in my dream, but it's also kind of accident. Like I think I stumped into this realm of being a political artist from the beginning. I was just curious about whether, you know, your family talked about what happened to your grandparents because, you know, in my family growing up, my parents went through the Cultural Revolution. My grandfather was arrested during one of these political campaigns. But, you know, my parents didn't really talk about it because they were trying to not, you know, save the next generation from from knowing about the, that kind of suffering. Did your family, like, was this a part of your family history that you knew about? Um, I mean, there are two ways to do it. Some family choose to, you know, not mentioning it at all. Some family want to use it as a family listen uh, for their kids to to kind of saying, do not touch anything about art uh, because it's dangerous, which in my case is the later uh, like example of education. So I don't think uh, the story of my great parents' generation were used as some kind of uh, encouragement for me to pursuing their paths. Rather, kind of uh, uh, a listen that set the red line, see, if you do that, you'll be doomed, uh, regardless how successful you are, even like your parents, they're so great within their work, but it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Um, like my parents always say, uh, you should be uh, maybe a sheriff in the kitchen or a barber, because no matter what kind of time, people's hair grow, people's stomach get hungry, and you always have a job. And you don't cross with all those political lines. I wish you could see Shelley's face right now because she's relating to this so much. Right. Um, but so despite your family history, uh, it was actually, as I understand it, a Taiwanese rom-com that kind of set you down this path. Um, I I know the, the drama, like I know in a lot of interview uh, that some people want to kind of picture it as a as some kind of epiphany moment. I mean, uh, the very experience that because of the accidental Taiwan drama inserted with a documentary about Tiananmen Massacre uh, is significant, but I, I, I don't want to kind of dramatize it too much because really a change cannot be done uh, overnight there's no kind of silver bullets uh, with just one episode and change people's uh, understanding of a country or, or the view of the value uh, system of the world i mean uh, then i was pretty special for me but i wouldn't really say that determining uh, my whole world already because I think without my understanding of my family history, um, I wouldn't be able to immune to a lot of brainwash and wouldn't be able to uh, understand uh, the significance of Tiananmen Massacre that easy. Um, mm -hmm. So, but still, it, it was a it was a, a quite a powerful um, story or episode uh, within my life. So you felt this discontent with the system the Chinese Communist Party created. That had been growing for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I think the very beginning. I mean, well, yes, 
by the time there's some kind of competition uh, between these new sorts, which are communism and capitalism, uh, but the I guess the the world has proved which system is less worse, and definitely communism shall not be the way that a healthy country uh, would choose. But unfortunately, while China is running so well now, it's still kind of perpetuating uh, their narrative and saying this system is better. Yeah, we've definitely seen that with the coronavirus, amazingly. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, the whole situation started because of the censorship. Well, just like your program's name, hmm. uh, because of censorship that delaying uh, the very early intervention that any government should do to control the environment. Instead, what chi China's government did is to hide what happened, to punish the people who tried to spread the virus, like the uh, whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang. Um, so, uh, well, and now it's totally in the control because the Chinese government's incompetency and also they are, you know, covering the truth. Uh, however, well, now China is really trying to change their uh, image around the world and being like trying to picture themselves as a savior of the world, saying like we're the country who is controlling the situation, not Italy, not America. And that's very problematic. But you know what? Sometimes when you have a very powerful player and it has been using life again and again, um, it could influence some people and, and make people to believe the lie is actually the truth. And that's the situation we're facing now. What's your impression of how uh, young people in China view the Communist Party these days? I think it's very hard to tell because the total censorship that, um, I guess, the China that um, the Communist Party want the world to perceive is a very controlled one. So yes, if you only learn them online, then you will see everyone love Communist Party in China. Everyone united with the core Xi Jinping, and everyone want to see, you know, the Western country are the enemies of the stability of this regime. Um, but I don't think the real voice has been expressed clearly uh, from China, and sometimes you can see the glitch of the system, and you get a chance to to see the real voice from China. Like after the whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang passed away, there's a huge wave of backslash and even demanding the freedom of speech in China be merged online. I guess because the coronavirus really paralyzed Chinese system. Uh, for a period of time, which giving the space for the real voice to be heard just for a brief time. But that brief time, I think it gives me uh, confidence and hope because I know, I guess the majority of people knows what's going on and wants seeking change. It's just because the controlling is so severe and the punishment is so severe as well. So that makes people um, not that easy to express themselves. Um, but I have to say that China has been doing brainwash by education and the media for 70 years. So um, for the young generation, they have to go through a lot of difficulty to understand what the very fundamental fabric of the society. But I still believe that, you know, Information is like water and censorship is just a break wall that sometimes there are still truths being able to getting through the break wall or getting through the rocks and finally reach to its audience. But it takes time and people must be patient with those young people and giving opportunity for them to learn from different perspectives. It certainly isn't easy to express discontent in that kind of society. I'm curious, when was the first time that you created a work of art and you looked at it and you thought to yourself, wow, this could really get me in trouble? Um, I guess there's a, there's a gap between firstly I created work until, wow, this is getting me into trouble. 
it all started in 2011 when there was a major uh, bullet train or, or, or fast uh, high-speed train incident happening in Wenzhou in China. So two uh, high-speed train collide on each other and that become a national topic right after on Weibo, which is the Chinese equivalent version of Twitter. So by the time that's like nine, uh, eight years ago, um, by the time the, the, the internet environment in China is still relatively free compared with the time of now. I guess that's because of two things. The Chinese government hasn't had the uh, awareness to realize social media could really become a threat to this regime, uh, nor they have the you know proper technology uh, like AI-backed censorship now hmm. to controlling it either. So by the time this is, it's an interesting, interesting space online and people actually having uh, the ability to comment on a lot of things. So. I was very inspired by the time when everyone was jumping on this topic and trying to challenge the narrative from the government. And I just want to uh, use my voice to, to be a part of it as well. And apparently drawing is something I always like, so I started to try a political cartoon by the time. But it, it will still take a period of time uh, for me to realize, okay, now I really have a fan base like my work is recognized and in the meantime probably my work is recognized by the regime as well mm. it's always nice to know that the communist party is watching you yeah well they're always watching you they watch everyone but i think they have a kind of a database or evaluation system and eventually uh, you're jumping from a, a average um commentator or or critique to someone they really think, oh, you post you post a threat now. And I learned it in a very hard way, of course. Tell us about that. Um, so, well, if you're familiar with my work, you will understand that actually since the very beginning of my art career, I've been anonymous. Uh, that's why I some, sometimes people call me China's Banksy, but, uh, which is a name I never liked because you don't get your family got harassed in Britain just because you do doing something on the wall. <laughs> but hey, it's China, it's different. Um, so, I, like I said, I learned it in a very hard way um, in the end of 2018, uh, when I supposed to have a huge exhibition, a personal exhibition uh, in Hong Kong. And it was a very uh, well noticed event that we will have Joshua Wong, and Pussy Riot, and other famous domestic Hong Kong artists join in for the opening, and everything seems uh, was under the line, and it's very good until three days before the opening, the Chinese police knocked on my doors in Shanghai, my hometown grabbed my relatives, interrogated them, and sending the threat message to me, which is very clear. They want my show to be canceled. And until that point, I realized, okay, my protection of being anonymous has been blown away. They've learned who I am, and they want to set me as an example of silencing. And, and that, that was probably the darkest day of my life. Do you have any idea how they figured out who you were? It's very hard to tell. Like, I am not naive, and I don't think it's easy job to hide a trace uh, for years, but also trying to make a name uh, as a challenge of the Chinese regime. So it could be anything. It could be my device is compromised. It could be maybe some of the public appearance, like my street art or our performance uh, got observed by an agent and they learn who I am. It could be someone I trust is, is a spy or someone I, I trust who might have my contact have a compromised device. Uh, this is an endless question that it's very hard to tell. But I have to say that sometimes the devil is in the place that you expect the least. 
actually the biggest leak of my personal information is due to a fellow dissident. Really? Believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's quite um, a frustrating experience. Um, you know, now within the Chinese, so-called Chinese dissident community, there are a lot of people actually blindly following Trump and think he will be the savior of China just because he's waging the, the trade war against the Chinese regime. However, uh, I never really trusted Trump. I don't think someone uh, disrespect basic or universal human rights would really care about the life in China. It's merely just serve his own interest. Uh, but a lot of people didn't see it, including a uh, Chinese famous dissident, Liao Yi Wu, a writer now who is based in Berlin. So the whole thing is like he's twittering something that the New York Times shouldn't criticize Trump because he's really the hero. And I wrote something challenging his opinion, then leading into his revenge that exposed where wow. I worked. Yeah, it's, it's just a saga that no one expected would happen to someone you used to look up to or, or believe. But, but this is a difficulty that we're facing because everyone somehow is desperate. And when people are desperate, they will just act strangely and out of reasoning. So at the time when you were about to have the show in Hong Kong, you were actually still hiding your face, right? You like you would wear a ski mask to events. You wouldn't, you know, show uh, who you were on on camera or in public. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, and in, in the meantime, I'm actually making this documentary, China's Awful Dissident. And if you had a chance to watch it, you'll see the very beginning of the film, which is about two years before the show. Uh, we had to film it in a way that wasn't giving away my identity at all. So every time if I show myself, I will be wearing a mask. We're avoiding uh, a structure like ears. We're avoiding my fingerprints. We're even thinking to hire an actor to actually act out my voice uh, because we're worried about, like I'm worried about uh, the voice recognition could sell me out. So basically I wouldn't even be able to do a uh, podcast with you guys because uh, obviously if we don't have auto the sound, I will be worried that this can be, you know, used to, to analyze and find who I am. So. You live in Australia now. Uh, do, do you still feel like you face pressure from the Chinese Communist Party th there? Yeah, 24-7. Because after I revealed my face, um, I've been received a lot of different kind of direct threats. Uh, I've been followed by very suspicious people several times. Um, my internet got attacked. I have to use VPN time to time to get access to internet. Um, well, there are strange cars parking outside of my residence, uh, and this also happened to the people who related to me, like the film director of my documentary, uh, and his, well, official email service got hacked, and it's confirmed by uh, his service provider saying there's someone attacking the service and trying to paralyze it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think now in in our world there's any place which is 100% safe or free from the harassment of the Chinese government. They're really getting more stronger and being more aggressive as well. So why did you reveal your identity? I mean, here is the thing. If the government has no who I am, then there's really no purpose to hide anymore. And actually, by showing my face, it, it opened my word. It makes me having more opportunity to talking to people like you or, or talking to people who I used to uh, really worry if that were leading the leak of my identity. Um, and, you know, that actually become a new way to protect myself, which is communicate with more people, creating more platform for my art, 
then in that way, I would be more recognized and receive more support uh, around international community. But also, I do hope my art or my action will inspire more people to join me. So um, in another way, if more people are doing that, uh, the less risk that we will share as individual. And that's uh, the very reason um, or that's the very uh, result that we would want to challenge this regime. Has the Chinese Communist Party come after your family at all? According to what happened in Hong Kong, they already did that. And it's very common for them to press on dissidents' family. If they can't reach you directly, um, and that's, that's what they do. They hurt the people that you care and love. Um, for my personal situation, after the Hong Kong incident, I'm cutting all the connection uh, with my family and friends from China um, because I think probably that would be the best way for them to stay not connected with me. That must have been very hard. Yeah, well, that's what Chinese government trying to do. They won't put anyone who challenged them into this catch-22. And one way you, you want to say that the way the Chinese government treating people is inhumane, but on the other way, you would have to continue your fighting to, to kind of distance yourself from your family and the one that you love. It's, it's actually also a process of inhumane, but what a choice do we have? No, I don't think so. Well, so do you think it was worth it? If, if you could go back in time, would you do something different? I doubt. I don't think so because, well, firstly, I see myself as an artist. And let's say to be recognized as an activist or dissident is merely the f side effect uh, from me making my art. I mean, every artist have to create their works around the topic they really care and experience. And for my case, I'm always interested in the human condition or human struggle through the history. And of course, I am born in China and that society is the one that I know the most and care the most. So naturally, the topic of my art will always be around the human rights issue about China or human rights issue in other society when I have enough experience in that. Um, However, I just cannot imagine that if I stop doing that, what else I will do and what else I can, I can do as good as the thing that I'm doing now. It's really if I stop making my arts, it will be a betray to myself and I wouldn't really know what to do for the rest of my life. You could always cut hair. <laughs> uh, on my beard, yes. <laughs> of course, you could also be a lawyer and then you'd be like... Uh... Gao Zhisheng or Chen Guangcheng. Yeah, exactly. So, so <laughs> that would be the case. You know, if I didn't pursue uh, the past of my great parents to be an artist, I might end up in prison even earlier when the Chinese Communist Party is cracking down on the human rights lawyers several years ago. So I didn't really see any exit uh, <laughs> of my life. Hey, I'm just saying you've never heard of the Chinese dissident barber. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I can create a lot of like tenement seam uh, <laughs> hairstyle. All right, you figured out a way. Yep. Um, well, so let's talk about some of your recent work. Uh, I know you just did a project called um, the Wuhan Diary. Uh, tell us about that. Right, right. So Wuhan Diary is uh, a new project that I'm running, um, collaborating with a residence who who is still under locking down in the center of this uh, pandemic, the city of Wuhan. Um, so we all know the censorship is really severe in China, that the people having difficulty to express themselves safely, especially for the people in Wuhan, because what has been locked down or quarantined are not just their physically mobility, but also uh, their, their, their desire or their willing to talk to the outside world. And we've already seen numerous arrests of uh, citizens or citizen journalists uh, like Chen Jiu-shu uh, and other people. So 
I provide, uh, I call out on social media to saying that I am happy to any Wuhan residents. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be your voice, uh, especially for the people who are in Wuhan under lockdown. And because I know how risky it will be for people to talk directly online, and I know how hard to to hide their identity by doing so, because obviously I am the uh, bad example of hiding myself. <laughs> so I provide this service to them to say, I like to be your voice and let my platform and let my follower to be your platform as well, so that you can tell the story to the world. You can tell the first hand experience of what does it mean to be locked down inside of a city in China and what it takes. So the also is so the also is among one uh, of those people who really put trust on me and starting to provide me the information uh, from the city inside. And obviously, I did not just to publish help the resident to publish it in Chinese. I also. Um, organize the translation so uh, there'd be more people around the world to understand the situation of the coronavirus in China. Um, and in the meantime, I also illustrate um, for the diary every day as well, because I think it is always very important to providing a different perspective by visual language of it. Uh, plus, it will be a kind of a advertisement for the diary, so so that more people will having the chance to read it. For me, I think the the, the Wuhan diary is uh, quite significant in a way because it's really a personal perspective that's showing the life under the quarantine. Um, I always say individual perspective and narrative is the best way to defeat this kind of united official or national narrative. Uh, it is the most you know, intimate way uh, for the people outside of China to, to understand the situation as well, because it's, it's personal. It's, it's very easy to, to, to make people to you know, putting themselves into the role as well. And you know, uh, those kind of story are are not easy to be seen on traditional media as well. Um, for the media that we always know, the way that they cover the story is is very different. It will be more like a, a big picture of what's going on. It it will be more about uh, the numbers of you know whether it's infected or that that's row. But it's very hard to building a case that's showing. Um, individual story. So the Wuhan diary is a great uh, supplement to where the plays the news cannot cover. And that's why I think it's very meaningful. So you really believe art can make a change in Chinese society? Well, I wouldn't be so sure about if it can trigger change for this moment or for tomorrow. Um, because in that way, you will your hope will die very soon. Um, mm. But I do believe art is a very powerful form. If it is not for change, but at least it providing a record of this period of history. I always see art as a form of expression. It's a language. It's something that helping you to record and express your personal perspective or your personal story. And if we have a lot of artists or a lot of people who are doing that, and in the future when we reflect on this period of time, um, you will see the truth via different storytelling. But if we on only have vo one voice from this totalitarian regime, then we wouldn't be able to see what's really going on. And in the future, we wouldn't be able to avoid the same problems. I don't know how powerful art will be for tomorrow, but I think as a personal practice, I have faith in it. And it definitely has the influence among the people. And it definitely has a very long life period. Because when we're thinking about art, we can trace it back to the very beginning of human civilization. 
and it's regardless the ideology or or the political bias because beauty itself is timeless it's valuable and so that's why i believe that art has its unique role um challenges the regime but also become a part of the history that we will always be able to trace back and remember it that was very touching actually you're you're not only a brilliant artist you're very good at expressing things in english um well i supposed to be a lawyer you know yeah i guess so <laughs> So one thing I want to touch on is I know art played a really big role in the Hong Kong protest movement. Right. And we we were there uh, a lot during the protest in 2019, and we saw your yeah. work a lot on the Lenin Wall. Um, what did the Hong Kong protest mean to you? I think it's very personal. Um, well, firstly, because my show got censored. Mm-hmm. And which is about seven months, eight months before the whole major protests being kicking in. I would say every dissolving of freedom in every society, it always started from freedom of speech. And art is on the avant-garde side of the freedom of speech. And a cancelled show is a strong example to showing that the whole society is going into a very bad direction. Of course, when my show got censored, uh, my life got fundamentally changed. My opportunity to show my work got stripped away. But after that, I received so many helps uh, from the Hong Kong society. You know, actually, the very next day, someone printed out all my cartoons and put it outside of a Chinese, uh, a mainland China, on the bookstore other way of protest. And then the very next day, people like Joshua Wan and Pussy Riots, um, they throw a media conference, uh, well, right after the cancellation and showing the solidarity with me. And then after that, online, I've been receiving, you know, a heartwarming message constantly. So I really appreciate what Hong Kong did to help me to going through this most difficult time. And it's really heartbreaking to see this beautiful society is going to be disappeared because the invasion of the Chinese regime on its freedom of speech, on its independence of judiciary and on its democracy. Um, so for me, I really want to be a part of the protest. Uh, with my art, I really want to helping those people to defend uh, their country and def- defend their value or defend their city. Um, so when I see my art has been used by the protests in the parade or put on the Lenin War, it's a huge inspiration and it's a huge honor. For me, it's like now I take my gallery back and as if the whole city become my gallery. Hmm. Uh, it's just a, like they say, a glory moment, not just glory to Hong Kong, but I guess within this movement, I, I share the glory wisdom. Um, and I do hope the Hong Kong protest will continuing. I know this is a difficult time because of the coronavirus outbreak and everyone have to um, use proper measurement to prevent the virus being spread. But I don't think the cause has died in Hong Kong and anger has died either. Um, And I believe after uh, this pandemic of the coronavirus, the first thing that Hong Kong will have and the first thing what Hong Kongers will do is revive um, the movements. And I'm pretty sure we'll see the protest again in Hong Kong. What would you like to see happen in China in the future? Um, Obviously, I want to see this government being dissolved and stepping down. I want to see there are democracy that happening in China. Um, And I also hope the way the revolution or the change will not be too violently or too deadly. but unfortunately, I don't think 
I think the possibility of peaceful transition is getting smaller and smaller, because the Chinese government or Communist Party now, they did not show any like willing to compromise and to to helping this smooth transition um, from happening. And in fact, they just cling on the power and sitting on this timing bomb, um, regardless of of the whole big environment is shifting. And it's it's very dangerous. Uh, but I do hope that there'll be change to China and there'll be good change to it. Oh, can I ask when the last time is you were in China? Oh, that's actually. Um, long time ago, six or five years ago, after I have the Australian citizenship, I feel like uh, probably it'll be safe to go back to China. And the worst they can do is reject me from entering the border. But now, when I uh, you know look back to it, I think I'm still naive. You know, especially after the Guiming Heights incident, they can well make you voluntarily. Giving up your foreign nationality and join the Chinese nationality, so really, there's there's no safe way for me to go back to China anymore. I don't think so. Do you ever dream about being able to go back someday? Um, of course. I mean, the biggest challenge that I'm facing as 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 an artist, uh, apart from being followed by the Chinese government and threatened 24-7, um, which is that I'm so far away from the topic that I, I try to address. And the biggest challenge is how do I keep my art authentic that is still relevant to China? If I am thousands of miles away from it, if I do not have the experience that living inside of this country so being able to go back to China is definitely a very helpful to my art. But I guess it won't be helpful if I get arrested instantly. Um, so fortunately, we still have internet that, that, that giving me constantly the information from inside of China via those brave people who are using VPN to go around the Great Firewall to, to tell their story. Uh, in China, and that's exactly how Wuhan Diary is helping me to understand the situation and creating art around those topics. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. That was very touching. Uh, for anyone listening who wants to learn more about you or your work, where should they go? Well, actually, I always see the online platform as my gallery. So my Twitter, Bado Tao, and Instagram, Bado Tao, are probably the best place to see the updates for my artwork. I also have an artist website, uh, www.badotao.com, and it has a good profile and collection of my previous art as well. And just to spell that out for anyone listening, it's B-A-D-I-U-C-A-O. Thank you for joining us. I have to say I really... I really personally enjoy a lot of your work, except for that one really creepy one you did where you put Xi Jinping's face on Carrie Lam. Uh, I think I had nightmares about that. <laughs> well, the big brother and big sister is watching you all the time. <laughs> That's certainly true in Hong Kong. Yes, yes, unfortunately. Well, thank you again for joining us and take care. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking forward to more great works of art from you. Yeah, well... Uh, I've noticed your uh, political satire uh, program long time ago, and I really appreciate it as well. I think it's smart, it's it's sharp, it's 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 better quality than a lot of kind of uh, you know uh, dissident program, and I think that's the way to do it. So keep going, and I know you just uh, having more than a million su- subscribers on YouTube. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I think we all really appreciate that coming from you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in the future, that I'd be happy for more collaboration because I really like your program. 100%. All right. Thanks again for being here. Yeah. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Wow. That was, that was A-OK, guys. 
it's always weird to me hearing that people know who we are. Especially famous people. I mean, he's famous in the Chinese dissident community or the art community. It's not like Richard Gere watches us, but, you know, I'll hey, take we it. we don't know. We should reach out to Richard Gere. <laughs> and that will be another day. Anyways, to all of you listening, I hope you're enjoying some tea from Path of Cha. Go to go.pathofcha.com slash unscripted and buy some tea. It's delicious. You know, one thing he talked about that made me think was how he was saying that, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we talk about or when he gives media interviews, people want this like moment of, you know, enlightenment or something where like he suddenly realized that you know, what the Chinese government was saying was a lie Mm -hmm. or about Tiananmen or whatever. And I've heard that from other Chinese people who have gone through this, you know, process of, oh, like detoxing from the brainwashing, Mm -hmm. more or less that it's not just one moment, right? It's this gradual course of, because you have to kind of keep exposing yourself to Hmm. that alternate point of view, because the you're like you don't want to give up what you've believed for so many years or what you were taught in school and all these things um so it's like a 12-step detox program well i mean it just like it's a process so it might not be just like once you see like a documentary about tiananmen square and then you're like oh that's the truth or whatever grand moment um but i was thinking about a lot of the um people who watch our show and Mm -hmm. they're angrily typing about you know kind of pro chinese communist party stuff in the comments and thinking maybe if they watch enough episodes they'll detox yeah well we've produced like a thousand episodes so far so we have gosh but it's funny about the those like those grand moments did i ever tell you guys how i how i started china uncensored i was walking down the street and then the clouds parted (laughs) a dove landed on my shoulder and whispered into my ear the chinese communist party is evil start a youtube channel and you were like, what's YouTube? Because this happened in, what, like 2002? 2012. <laughs> I, I think it was established what YouTube was by then. Oh, I mean, Had I started I was trying to give you also the power of prophecy. Oh, well, then it'd just be lazy. It's like, I got this message in 2002, and it took me 10 years to make good on it? <laughs> that doesn't make me look good, Shelley. See, I'm actually imagining the clouds parting, and it's like the god but from monty python that's exactly what i'm imagining too yeah you mean what you experienced yes yes what i experienced that is not what i was imagining what were you imagining i don't even know that's not important it's not important you were imagining xi jinping's face on carrie lamb no 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 never imagine that the stuff of nightmares i tell you All right. Yeah, be sure to check out his art. You will not regret it. Um, Yeah, and we got to put our heads together and figure out some kind of super cool collab with him. Hey, if you guys have any ideas, leave that in the comments below. We'll steal your ideas. Thank you in advance. (laughs) Thanks for listening to China Unscripted. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Talk to you next time.